Just wanted to make this little video to get you guys familiar with obtaining vital signs. My goal really would be for you to uh, work your way through this video. It's going to be broken into three basic components. It's going to be a central nervous system component, a respiratory component, and a circulatory component. And then I'd like you to go through each component one at a time and then pause the video. Uh, if you have a roommate or a family member or someone that there's no COVID risk, obviously, uh, it would be great for you to practice on them. It would be wonderful for you to do that. Uh, I have attached in the module that's included in this video, there's a, uh, a document that you can download uh, or print out, I guess, and you can fill this out uh, on the findings you obtained from your live patient. Unfortunately, Bob here, Bob is a mannequin, as you can kind of figure out already. Because of COVID and all that, I really can't have a live a live person doing this, unfortunately. I do apologize, but that's just the way it is uh, in these times that we have. Um, so as you already know from previous lectures, that before we can touch a patient or uh, treat a patient, assess them, we need to get permission. And I know you learned about uh, consent. And I know then if someone is awake and alert and, and oriented, uh, they need to say yes. They need to express to us that they give us consent. If they're disoriented or unconscious uh, or deeply in, in, under the influence of drugs or alcohol and you don't feel like they're able to make their own decisions, then what we do is we use what we call implied consent. But even if they have implied, con even if they're disoriented, we're using implied consent to, to obtain vital signs and do an assessment on them. Remember, these people they might be disoriented, they might be out of it, but let them know what you're doing because imagine if you were half asleep and someone grabbed your arm suddenly. Um, someone might misconstrue this as, as an attack and they might attack you. So approach the patient, ex tell them your name, hi, I'm here to help you, I'm gonna take your blood pressure, and just talk them through that, uh, to just even if they're disoriented. And it's you know, people with Down syndrome, dementia, Alzheimer's, people with brain injuries, things like that, uh, they might not understand what you're doing uh, unless you telegraph your moves, essentially. So the first component of this is going to be the central nervous system component. That means the brain and brainstem. For me, uh, you think about consciousness, about assessing the level of consciousness. Well, that's all basically is rooted basically in your brain. Uh, also, I include in this component pupils because pupils respond to what happens in, 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 in the brain, essentially, or at least in the cranial vault as well. So I'm going to include APU with this. And remember, APU is alert uh, to voice, to pain, and unresponsive. That's how this person is responding to our presence, basically. And then I'm going to do that, and then I'm, I'm going to obtain his orientation level, person, place, and time. And then when I get done with that, I'm going to kind of plug all that in and get my Glasgow Coma Scale. And then at some point, I'll be getting pupils on this patient as well. So I'll start out, introduce yourself. Best thing to do is walk up to the patient. Remember, you're, you're getting that initial impression as you walk up. Uh, Bob here, his eyes open spontaneously. I go, hi, sir, my name's John, I'm an EMT. Uh, what's your name? And he says, it's Bob. And I go, Bob, uh, where are we right now? And he says, he's at home and he knows that it's Tuesday. So he's oriented times three, eyes open spontaneously. So he's alert and oriented times three. I can add one more component to this and I can obtain my Glasgow Coma Scale. Sir, would you mind ra raising your right hand? Thank you. So now he followed command. So if you go to your Glasgow Coma Scale, his eyes open spontaneously, he gets a four. He is fully oriented times three, he gets a five, and he follows commands, he gets a six for a total of 15. The only other component now of this is going to be the pupils. Now when it comes to pupils, you're going to use your little pen light, if I can find it here. And, and if you noticed this already, you probably have, but I'll bring it up close to the video here. It has these little cute little uh, round uh, circles here, and they correspond in millimeter size. So what you want to do first, be prior to applying light to the patient's pupils, you want to measure the size of their pupils. And remember, the size of their pupils can be diagnostic for us. Really, really, really tiny pupils uh, can indicate things like heroin overdose or some kind of narcotics. Really large pupils can be caused by 
different kinds of drugs, especially amphetamine products, cocaine, alcohol can do that. And of course, the other poisons can do that as well. So we look at pupil size as a diagnostic tool for us. So now what we're going to do is have the patient stare at a fixed point, maybe uh, the clock on the wall or your finger or your forehead, whatever is appropriate in the space that you're in, and you're going to apply light uh, after you obtain the size of the pupil. So let's say, let's say Bob's pupils are about 5 millimeters. That's about normal for an adult like we have here. He's a really big adult too. And what I want to do is I don't want to, I don't want to put light directly into his eyeball because it hurts. So I'm going to do like a little J sweep, essentially. And I'm going to sweep in from the side and just come up in a little J. And what I'm doing is I'm doing this is as I'm indirectly applying light, I'm looking at that pupil and seeing whether it constricts. I'm also looking at the other pupil and seeing if it constricts at the same time and at the same rate. Remember that, that pupils have what's called a consensual reflex. When you apply light to one pupil, the other pupil should respond identically. So how this works is you apply light to one pupil, you notice that this pupil constricts, you notice the other one constricts as well. You go to the other side, do the same thing, get that J, get on that J sweep up, and you do the same thing. And now you know that both pupils are constricting equally. They're about five millimeters in size prior to applying light. So they're as we would call pearl, right? So pearl is pupils equal and reactive to light. And then all you'd have to write is at five millimeters. And don't forget the mm on the end because otherwise it's five what, right? You have to actually document what my measurement you're, you're measuring, essentially. So again, I'll do it one more time. You have the person stare at a fixed point, probably not up into a light, uh, light fixture because the light itself, the ambient light, will cause his pupils to constrict. And we're going to create that little kind of J sweep, come up under, just very lightly, not directly into the eye, and we're observing for the pupil that we're applying light to constrict, and we're also making sure there's consensual reflex. So what I like you to do now is I like you to stop the video, and go to your partner, and go through AFPU, go through Glasgow Coma Scale, and, and pupils. When you're done with that, it shouldn't take too long. I do it a couple of times. Write down uh, on that document your findings. There's, I think, four fields you can fill out, four different sets of vital signs. And then uh, stop the video, and then when you're done with that, uh, restart the video for the next uh, session. Thanks. Okay, so hopefully that, uh, that previous module uh, was pretty quick, pretty fast, pretty easy. You, got a, uh, you obtained a uh, AFPU, a Glasgow Coma Scale, and you obtained uh, pupil size and reactivity on the patient. We had already talked to the patient. We determined that they want us to assess them. They expressed to us that they wanted to assess, and we're going to continue the process. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go through their circulatory phase. Now, uh, the reason why I'm doing it this way is I'm trying to break it down into body system components, essentially. Uh, in the field, and you're actually, actually working out in the field as an EMT, um, in what order you take your vital signs are really going to be dependent upon the patient's presentation. Uh, you don't have to do it this way. You do where everything is highest priority. If someone's complaining of breathing problems, you probably want to listen to their lungs first watch how they're breathing and also get a pulse oximeter reading. That'd be your highest priority. If someone appears to be going into shock, you'd want to get a blood pressure and a pulse and skin. So how you do this is your choice in the field and that just comes with time and experience uh, just running calls and assessing patients. But let's move on to the circulatory phase. So let's obtain a pulse first. Now we know that if the patient is awake and alert uh, or at least they're sitting up, they're looking at us, they're a medical patient or a mild status trauma patient, more than likely we're going to obtain the pulse from the radial site. Remember the radial site is on the thumb side and you take your two fingers and you slide your two fingers down the pad of the thumb into the wrist right here and push in gently, you should feel a radial pulse. Uh, you want to keep the arm 
uh, at or below the level of the heart to make sure that you feel the strength of the pulse is accurate or not with that. Uh, the other, of course, the other point here we go for quite commonly is the carotid pulse as well. Uh, on some trauma patients, if they're pretty critical, you might check a radial and carotid simultaneously. That not only, not only gives you the pulse rate, rhythm, and quality, but it also determines if there's a difference between peripheral versus central pulses. If the carotid pulse is strong and the peripheral pulse is weak, that could tell you that they're low on, low on blood, blood pressure and they probably are in shock. So we'll go through this. So again, we have permission to the patient. We're going to obtain a radial pulse, and we get rate, rhythm, and quality. So for purposes of our program, we multiply 30 seconds times 2 to obtain a one-minute pulse. So we have a watch with a sweep second hand or some kind of digital watch for that, and we're going to find the radial pulse and we're going to count for 30 seconds. We count for 30 seconds. Let's say I, I obtained 40 beats in 30 seconds, so I'd multiply times 2. It'd give me 80 beats per minute. Then I would determine was it regular or irregular. If every beat follows the next at the same, basically the same rhythm, essentially, then it's regular. If there's skips between the beats, the beats kind of speed up and slow down, uh, that's irregular. So in this case, I have a, a heart rate of, of 80. It seems to be regular and it's strong. I also want to note where I found it, because that's also diagnostic for us. So I found it at the radial site. If I could not find a radial pulse, what would that, what would that tell you? It would tell you that their blood pressure is probably pretty low. So again, you want to, doc, do, you want, you want to document not only the rate, rhythm, and quality, but also the location where the pulse was found. So we have 80 regular and strong at the radial site would be an appropriate way of, of uh, describing this patient's pulse. Now, when it comes to skins, uh, I know your book describes, you, we're going to have our BSI on, our goggles and gloves and all kinds of stuff. Uh, but your, your book describes you pulling back the glove and pressing it against the person's forehead or the side of their cheek, something like that. Um, I don't recommend that in the field just because of all the horrible stuff out there, the scabies and the bed bugs and the rashes and all kinds of stuff. And you can still, you can still feel their temperature and their moisture through your glove uh, pretty easily. So we're going to obtain uh, a uh, uh, skin. So it's color, temperature, and condition. So color on a normal healthy person should be pink. Uh, temperature should be warm and condition should be dry. So that's normal, healthy person. If there's anything out of the ordinary, if they're, if they're pale, if they're bright red, uh, if they're sweating, if they're excessively dehydrated and they look really dry, uh, or they're you know really uh, uh, sweaty, you guys get the idea, essentially. So I'm going to check temperature. So he's warm, his skins appear pink, and they're dry. I can also get cap refill on the patient as well. You can take their finger, you blanch their index finger right here, blanch it, release, and because he's an adult male, it should re, the capillaries should refill in less than two seconds, which they do. So right now I have skins that are pink, warm, and dry, and immediate cap refill, the way you would document that. If you happen to notice there was any abnormality, you would just document that. If they're pale skins or, uh, like I mentioned, hot skins, things like that. Now, blood pressure. Again, this is part of your circulatory system. Uh, blood pressure. I know you purchased a stethoscope and a, uh, and a blood pressure cuff. I just wanted to point a couple of things out. This is probably the stethoscope or something similar that you purchased. It's called a dual lumen stethoscope. And what I wanted to point out is the earpieces specifically. You know, you notice when they come out of the box, they're kind of flat like this. Well, the way your ear canals are is actually the ear canals face forward towards your nose. So prior to applying this to your ears to listen, you want to make sure these things are kind of bent in forward towards your nose so they fit snugly in your ear canals and they don't aren't occluded by the skin in your ears. It should look like that. 
basically. Whatever's comfortable for you. On the other end of this, it has a double-sided diaphragm head. The, this is the low tone side. This is the one we use predominantly in the field as EMTs. And this is great for lung sounds. It's great for obtaining a blood pressure, auscultated blood pressure. The smaller diaphragm, or you might have a bell, which is kind of just basically looks like a bowl essentially, but same idea. Uh, this is for high tones. Uh, so something like strider sounds in the neck, or they use this on children a lot, and sometimes they use it for, a, like, a, if the doctor's listening to epigastric sounds, which we don't honestly do in the field. So predom predominantly, you're going to be using this larger diaphragm, this little plastic on there. So the first thing you want to make sure with this thing is make sure that this head is, is turned the right way. It actually flips and it turns one side on and it turns the other side off. So you want to make sure that this thing is flipped the right direction so you're obtaining the sounds that you need. So uh, bend your earpieces like I described. Make sure they fit comfortably in your ears. And then what you want to do is you want to tap on the larger of the diaphragms here. If, you, if it sounds really dull, turn it half a turn. I guarantee it will. It, it should be really loud when you, when you tap it. When you tap it and it's really loud, it means you're on the right side and you'll be able to obtain the sounds you, you need, essentially. The other component of this is a BP cuff. Now, these come in four different sizes. We carry three of those sizes on the ambulance. This is a standard adult size. And what I wanted to point out to you guys, and it might be hard to see and I apologize, but and your cuff might be different, but you'll notice right here it says artery left and artery right, essentially. So those arrows should point towards the brachial artery. you also notice, too, on the edge, on this side, it says index. And on this side, on the inside, it says range. So when you apply this to a patient's bicep, this range arrow, this index arrow, should fall within that range that's printed on the back of this cuff. So technically, this would only fit people that have, have a, it's hard to do this, I apologize, but an arm about that big essentially. If you have someone with really big biceps or you have a really obese patient, we do have larger cuffs. This is my Viagra cuff, just in case I need to party, essentially. Uh, but you can see that this technically could uh, fit a very large person. You could even put this on someone's thigh if you wanted to, if they had no arms, and it does happen, I'm sorry to say, or they had uh, serious burns to their arms, and you can't use their arms as a source of blood pressure. You might use their leg as well. They also have a pediatric cuff. And this is for children three years of age and older, so... And again, this is, you know, size dependent. Uh, there's also an, a cuff for infants, but we don't carry them in the ambulances because they're not, uh, not very uh, accurate for us. They're in the hospital setting predominantly. Okay, so um, what I first want to do is I want to obtain, I want to find where the brachial artery is. And if you remember from anatomy and I was talking about this, brachial artery travels down the medial side under the bicep right here, and it joins, this is called the antecubital space where your, where your elbow bends on the inside here, and it kind of joins in here and it splits into two arteries, the ulnar and radial artery. And so it's going to be somewhere in this area on the medial side. So what you do is you, you find, you, the person's bicep will come down and the bicep will kind of end and start to go under, basically come down under the skin essentially. If you put your fingers right where the bicep disappears and slide your fingers medially, that means towards the midline, and push in gently, you should feel the brachial artery somewhere in that area. So the reason why we want to know where that is is because we want to point that arrow that's on the cuff to that location. It's really important that we do that because what that does is it orients the bladder that's inside the cuff to the brachial artery and it applies pressure to the brachial artery correctly to obtain a correct blood pressure. If we put the cuff on without doing this, we are going to get a, a bad blood pressure, essentially. 
So I've obtained that, and I got my blood pressure cuff here. It's an adult size. And uh, with the blood pressure cuffs, a couple more things. Is this, the, this is the inflation balloon, which I'm sure you know already. Uh, this is the valve to inflate or def deflate the uh, cuff, the bladder inside the blood pressure cuff, essentially. This little valve right here, if you turn it all the way to the right till it stops, it allows you to then inflate the cuff and cut off the flow of blood distal to the cuff to obtain those blood pressures we're trying to get today. Um, as you turn it back to the left, it deflates the cuff to obtain that blood flow through the artery again to obtain that pulse, to obtain the blood pressure, essentially. Uh, this is one of the hardest things to master is releasing this valve just a little tiny bit and allow that needle that's on the dial here, on the gauge, to drop nice and slow and steady so we can get an accurate blood pressure. If you drop it too quickly, you might miss one beat, and that one beat could be 10 or 12 points difference in a blood pressure. It would skew your, your pressure dramatically. If we go way too slow and we start and stop, it's very painful for the patient and it can be also not accurate as well. So let's put this on the patient. So remember, we found the brachial artery. We want to, we want to gently grasp the person's arm like this. We put it on our, our knee here or on our leg right here. Uh, I want to locate the arrow pointing towards the artery. Cuff goes on nice and snugly. It's within that index range we talked about, so it fits the patient appropriately. If you can't see the uh, dial, you can take the dial, you can unclip it, and you can clip it to the uh, cuff of the device, or you clip it to, I don't recommend clipping it to their shirt, uh, but with their permission, I guess, that's fine. First thing we're going to obtain is a palpated blood pressure. So we're going to find the radial artery. There are two fingers on the radial artery. We're going to feel the radial, the radial pulse. We're going to turn that valve all the way to the right, and we're going to pump up the cuff until that pulse disappears under our fingers. We're going to pump it up, and when the pulse disappears, inflate it about uh, 20 points more, a couple more bumps, and then slowly let the air out and allow that needle to drop at a slow, steady rate, and you're going to feel for the return of that pulse. The very first beat that you feel under your fingers, you're going to document the number where that beat occurred, and then let out all of the pressure because it hurts the patient. So what I have attained here on Bob is 120 by palpation. So you, do you document this as a fraction, so 120 line and a P or palp underneath, and that's that's how you document uh, by palpation. Remember, we only get the systolic blood pressure on a palpated uh, blood pressure. So let's say you have that. So now you know that you have, this person has a systolic blood pressure of 120. So when you go to auscultate, you listen to their blood pressures, uh, you can then know roughly where you might want to inflate the cuff to. So if it's 120, you maybe go to 130 now, and then now you then come down from there essentially. But you, now you're listening for the sounds rather than feeling for them. It takes a little more practice to do this correctly. There's a lot of extraneous noises, the, the, the scope clicking together with the other parts of the stuff and all that great stuff can kind of throw you off a little bit. But with practice, you get pretty good at this, especially in a moving ambulance essentially. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to, I'm going to Take the person's arm. I'm gonna, you can also trap it under your arm like this if you're not concerned about any kind of transmission of weird stuff, essentially. Uh, you can place it on your, your pants. You can place it on the, uh, the gurney, whatever it might be. And then what you're going to do is you're going to then take your stethoscope. Ear pieces go in your ears. The diaphragm goes over the area where you found the uh, brachial artery, so right about here. Hold that in place, and you're going to inflate this to back up to, let's say, 130 or 140. It doesn't really matter. You're going to inflate this, and then you're going to gradually lower down that needle. You're going to watch and listen. When you hear that first beat, note the number. Keep deflating, keep deflating. 
And when that beat disappears, that's your diastolic number. So now I listened for the first beat. That was 120. That's my systolic. I continued to let the pressure drop. I continued to let the needle drop. When it went, basically went thump, that's 120. Then it went thump, thump, thump and then disappeared at 80. So this patient's blood pressure is oscillated at 120 over 80. And you again, it's a fraction, 120 line. 80 is how you would document it in your documentation. So uh, we're done with uh, the circulatory phase. i like you to stop the video and practice these components. You can watch it again. You can, uh, I would suggest that you practice pulse and blood pressure repeatedly to get good at this, uh, or at least become familiar with the process. It's a muscle memory type of thing. The more you do something like this, the easier it is for you to do, and you'll be more successful at it. Don't try to rush, take your time. This just it's not obviously a real patient, it's not critical. So, you know, practice and uh, when you're done, uh, document what you found on that, uh, on that form I gave you and then restart the third component of the, of the video. Thanks. Hello again. Uh, this is the third component of your vital sign practice. Hopefully you were able to obtain an auscultated as well as a palpated blood pressure successfully. Uh, don't be discouraged if it was kind of hard to hear the auscultated. It does take some practice. Uh, and uh, the more you do it, the better you'll get at it, essentially. And that's what it really comes down to with that. So the third and final component of this is going to be the respiratory component. Uh, this is going to be the uh, lung sounds. Uh, respiratory rate, rhythm, and quality, and pulse oximetry on the patient. Again, we've already obtained some type of consent to treat the patient, whether it's implied or, or whether it's expressed consent on the patient. We've gone through our other vital signs, and again, we can do this in whatever order is appropriate for the patient's condition, as I mentioned before. So first thing I want to do is we'll do respiratory rate, rhythm, and quality. So the rate, we count same situation as with the pulse, we're going to count for 30 seconds, we're going to multiply times two to get our, our rate over one minute of time. Uh, we're looking at the rise and fall of the chest. Now there's a couple ways of doing this for practice purposes. You can do it in the field as well, but um, eventually you'll get so good at this you won't have to, uh, to do this. So what you can do is you can take the patient's own hand, uh, hold it with your hand and place their hand on their chest or on their upper abdomen. And as they're breathing in and out, and one breath is one breath, basically in and out, that's one breath essentially, you're feeling for the rise and fall of your chest and you're counting for 30 seconds. So let's say with Bob here, I counted eight breaths in 30 seconds, so I got 16 breaths per minute rate. That's how he's breathing on his rate essentially. Then I wanna get the rhythm. now. There's only two choices on this. It's regular or, or irregular. Now, pretty much everyone is going to have a regular rhythm. There's uh, maybe one major exception, and that's when someone has a brain or brainstem injury. Remember back from your pathophys that the brainstem controls your respiratory rate, uh, your drive, your rhythm, and everything. So if you have a damaged brainstem, uh, then you can have in a, a patterned, irregular rhythm. So if you have someone who's hit their head or has been hit in the head and they're unconscious or semi-conscious and their breathing is very irregular and very erratic, that's really serious brain injury, essentially, and very rare thing that you're going to encounter in the field. So Bob here, though, he's fine. He's breathing at 16 times a minute. His, his, his rhythm is regular. And then I want to look for the quality of their breathing. And what it really comes down to is, is it labored or is it unlabored? Now, pretty much everyone, if they're not having any kind of respiratory distress, they should be breathing in effortlessly and in an unlabored way. 
So it's a good easy rise and fall of the chest. The chest should rise and fall about one inch or so. It's called excursion of the chest. I'm, I'm ex kind of accentuating it here, but it should rise and fall about an inch or so with each breath. And it, they should not be using any accessory muscles. Remember, when you encounter someone with labored respirations, you should immediately realize that somewhere in this person's respiratory tract, they have obstruction or they have some kind of resistance going on. This could be from an asthma attack, it could be a blockage of one of their bronchial tubes, it could be an infection. There's many, many different reasons why this person might have these conditions going on. And when the body recognizes this obstruction or this resistance, this increased resistance in the lungs, it starts to in, in employ more and more muscles to force more and more air into their lungs to keep this person alive. It's basically a, a compensatory phase uh, of this person's survival. So if I see in drawing and retractions and working hard to breathe, I, I don't know quite why it's happening yet, but I know this is a problem for the patient and this is a pretty serious patient. Luckily for Bob here, he has unlabored respirations with a good rise and fall of the chest. So I can assume his tidal volume, remember tidal volume is the amount of air enters your lungs in one breath. His tidal volume is adequate. So he has unlabored respirations with adequate tidal volume. So how you would document respiratory would be he's breathing 16 times. It's unlabored, uh, regular with good tidal volume. You can write that on your documentation sheet, 16, regular, unlabored, with good tidal volume, uh, or uh, you could write uh, big V, little t, that's actually the uh, abbreviation for tidal volume, large V, little t, don't ask me how that works, but that's what it is. So we have our story rate, rhythm, and quality now, and now we'll do pulse oximetry. So pulse oximetry, this is, a, this is the pulse oximeter that we have here at school. It's a little on button right here. It turns on. And there's a, there's a uh, finger probe. It's got a little uh, pictogram on it, which way the finger goes. So the index finger works best. So it kind of looks like this right here. It's going to start reading my pulse. It's called the pleth wave. You'll see it down below. It's kind of going back and forth. And it comes up with a number. That's my pulse right there. And then the upper number is going to be my oxygen saturation on room air. Now, if you want to make sure that that upper number, the 97%, is accurate, you can check my pulse. So if my radial pulse that you feel is 70 or 68 or 69 or 71, you could pretty much predict that that 97% is an accurate reading. If there's a gross difference between the pulse you feel at the radial site or carotid site, uh, and the number on this machine, it's telling you this machine's not reading correctly. Now, the reason why this can happen is their extremities are really cold from something like hypothermia. They could be deeply in shock, possibly, uh, or they could even have fingernail polish on, which is which can really skew this device. So these these devices aren't completely accurate and not very reliable. So what it really comes down to is look at the patients, just, just basically look at your patient, assess your patient. Uh, if they have a saturation of 80% and they're pale and they're cyanotic, then you could pretty much guess that number is pretty close. If they're pink, warm, and dry in their skins and the saturation is showing 70, there might be some disconnect here going on. So always look at your patient, treat your patient. This is just a this is a device that we use, and again, it's a tool that can be misused or misinterpreted. So, but luckily for me, Bob here, he's 98% on room air, and uh, I'm going to document that on my uh, on my paperwork, on your paperwork. You're going to put 98, and don't forget the percentage sign, and then room air. There's a box that says room air on there. Later on, if this were a call we were on, our second set of vital signs, we let's say we applied oxygen to Bob, we gave him two liters via nasal cannula or whatever we might have done, then we would document that on oxygen, the next number. And this helps us 
if Bob's saturations were 88% when we got here in room air, we gave him oxygen, it's now, it's now 98%, then we, we showed this improvement throughout the call, essentially. So Bob's breathing at 16 times. It's uh, regular, unlabored, with good tidal volume. Saturations are 98% on room air. He's doing pretty darn good. The last component of this is going to be uh, lung sounds. And again, you can do this in whatever order you want to do this in. Uh, lung sounds, we listen in, in three, I don't know why I'm holding on four fingers, we're getting tired here, three fingers, there you go, three feels. Uh, and they're going to be uh, second, third intercostal space, mid clavicular line, so right down, kind of the nipple line this way, fourth or fifth intercostal space under the armpit right here, and subscapular, which is going to be back here under the, the inferior angle of the scapula. You take your stethoscope out, uh, make sure that your little ear pieces are facing forward like I described earlier, they go into your ears, tap on the diaphragm, make sure that's working, place this over the second intercostal, third intercostal space, right in the middle of the mid-nipple line right here. The, this bone right here, that's, that's your, uh, your clavicle. If you take your finger and you slide your finger down, you'll feel the first notch, and that's the first intercostal space. The next bump is your second rib. The next notch is your uh, second intercostal, third intercostal space, and then your third rib. So you can see, you just go down and shorten this area. Have the patient open their mouth, take a deep breath in and out, listen for the sound, compare left and right, do the same thing in and out, breathe in and out. You're just comparing sounds. The same thing, you find the side here. So this is the first intercostal space, second, third, fourth, fifth. So somewhere just at or below the nipple line, under the armpit right here, you're going to listen bilaterally, take a deep breath in and out. Same on the other side, compare left to right. And now you have the anterior fields. So you had clear bilateral lung sounds in upper here, clear bilateral, sun, bilateral lung sounds on the lateral side here. You would then sit the patient up or roll them on their side, whatever is appropriate with the patient's condition. You listen to the inferior angle of the scapula, just right below. The scapular bones are kind of a triangular shaped bone in the back. And the bottom of that triangle on here, you're going to listen right there. Same thing, left and right. Take deep breath in and out. And you should hear, if the person has healthy lungs and no problems, you should hear air rushing in and out like air going through a tunnel or tubes. If you hear crackles or wheezes or gurgling, then of course those are, 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 are abnormal lung sounds that need to be investigated. If you hear nothing, it's called a silent chest. Uh, after you ruled out possible human error, like maybe when you put your scope on, you didn't check your diaphragm, and maybe you're listening on the wrong side so you can't hear anything, uh, then you know this person's lungs are so tight, his bronchial tubes are so constricted, they're not exchanging air effectively. This person is probably going to be a candidate for bag valve mass ventilation, so it's really important that we obtain lung sounds, especially on patients who have respiratory complaints for obvious reasons. So we've gone through the three components. He's breathing at 16 times. It's regular, unlabored, with good tidal volume. His saturations are 98% on room air. His lungs are clear bilaterally in all fields. And Bob's doing just wonderfully. So I'd like you to go through those three components with your partner. Uh, obtain those three parameters. Write them down. Document them as I described. And you should be done with your your one set of vital signs. Now I know there's not a field on that sheet of paper for lung sounds, so just write it in at the bottom if you like. Uh, just put lung sounds and just say clear bilaterally. It works for me. If they had wheezes, you would just document, you know, wheezes bilaterally or bronchi on the left and clear on the right, whatever is appropriate for the patient. So at, you're done with that component now, you're done with the third component then what I'd like you to do is then stop, kind of reread re your documentation, make sure that everything's been documented somewhat appropriately at this point, and then go back to your sheet of paper, uh, go to the top of the next field, the next column, uh, write in the time of when you're going to start, and obtain another full set of vital signs with, basically without stopping at this time.
the more you do this, the better you're going to get, essentially. Uh, I would like to have you do all four sets of vital signs today. That's the idea. Let's, let's exercise. When all four sets of vital signs are completed, and I know it might be on the same patient, but you know, practice is practice, essentially. I want you to document the time that you started your vital signs in those upper fields. Document those fields of your vital signs uh, as we described in the video as best you can. Uh, take a picture of it, scan it, and I'd like, I'd like you to attach it to the, uh, to the uh, discussion board of this module. And so I can critique it and you can make those changes uh, in your future uh, vital sign uh, assessment. So if you have any questions, just, tag, just write me in the chat board. I'll be, I'll be on board with that. I'll keep track of what's going on and make sure you guys are uh, doing as best you can. I do apologize that uh, we can't meet live and do this together, but again, it's you know the times uh, that we're going through right now. And Bob's been a very good patient. You should give him, give him a little applause, possibly. Uh, it's my favorite patient. They don't talk to you. They don't move. It's amazing. Thank you very much. Uh, have fun out there. Bye.